All right, welcome everyone to this week's Zojo webinar. I'm Paula Fever, the Zojo Developer Evangelist. And this week's topic is retro gaming. Should be a fun one, hopefully. So let's get started. We've got a, a fair amount of stuff to do. So you might remember that this past summer I did a Gaming with Zojo webinar. This was in July. Back when it was warm, now not so much. You can watch this webinar on YouTube on our Zojo channel. That's the actual URL, or you can just go to youtube.com slash gozojo. And in that webinar, I showed how to make a, uh, a game called 2048, a little slider number puzzle kind of game. So it's a fun game. I like it. And I also did a blog post recently, uh, I guess last month, uh, that covered that game as well, so you can uh, head on over the blog post if you uh, want a quick hit of the game rather than sitting through the entire webinar. But like I mentioned in that uh, webinar this summer, when you're making games at Zojo, there's really two things you need to worry about. One is the canvas, because you're pretty much going to have graphics. You're going to do all your drawing. You're going to need a canvas. And two, you're going to need a timer to allow you to have some sort of animation to move things around on your canvas. So with these two components, you can actually create quite a variety of games. In particular, retro games. So what exactly is a retro game? Well, I consider it to be games from the 70s and 80s. Games you may have played on an Atari 2600 or on older 8-bit computers like Commodore 64s, Atari computers, Texas Instruments computers, that sort of thing. And some fun examples are combat. This is the, uh, we're going to try and make a version of this in Zojo today. The version we'll make won't be quite as sophisticated as the Atari 2600 version, but I'm sure once you see how this can be done, you'll be able to whip up a, an exact duplicate. Other types of games in this genre include Space Invaders. I love Space Invaders. Asteroids. And even Pac-Man, which on the Atari 2600 was kind of bad, but there it is in all its glory. Now, retro games in general are exemplified by having a few common elements. They generally have a single screen. That's nice. It's easier to work with. That could be a single canvas in the case of Zojo. And they often use something called sprites, which are essentially just the little objects that move around in the game. Uh, on uh, Atari computers, and I think on the 2600, these were actually called player missile graphics because they were the players were the things you moved around and the missiles were the missiles. Uh, but those are the things that move around on the screen. And another aspect is that generally these games are pretty easy to play. And of course, a joystick was common for controlling them. Uh, we can simulate a joystick using the keyboard, or uh, if you have a USB uh, gamepad, you can actually use that with Zojo to uh, control your game. I have a, uh, looking at mine right here, I have a Macaulay, M-A-C-A-L-L-Y, Gamepad. It looks a lot like a PlayStation controller. And I believe, I haven't tested this personally, but the Xbox USB controllers also work with uh, computers as well pretty easily. And another common thing about retro games is they were often written in assembly language. This here is a snippet of the source code of the actual combat game for the Atari 2600. And our Zojo code will be considerably simpler. So Zojo Combat. This is a screenshot of hopefully our finished game. Some of the features that we're going to do are it's going to be a two-player game. So there will be two ways to control the tanks. Uh, eventually, we'll actually have it so that uh, the blue tank, the player one tank, you can control with the gamepad, and the red tank you can control using the keyboard. The tanks are completely movable. The tanks can actually shoot at each other and hit each other. 
you score a point when you hit the other tank. And there'll be some sound effects and joystick and keyboard control. So we're going to make this using Zojo right now. But let, before we dive right in, I want to just give a few high-level topics that we're going to go through, and then we'll be inside of Zojo making some code. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is have some just initial setup of the project. Um, this will have our main window, the canvas, the timer we want, uh, a few other setup properties, that sort of thing. Then we're going to make our tank, and we'll enable it to draw itself and move. We'll do the same thing for the missile, and it'll be able to draw and move, and we'll then add the ability to detect when a tank is hit and keep score, and then we'll put some finishing touches, which will include the sound and the joystick control. So here we are in Zojo, and, and Justin has noting that I should name this X. Zombat or Zombat or something. I'm not exactly sure. That's that's catchy. Maybe when I finish cleaning this project up and get it into the Zojo examples, it'll be called that. It's a good suggestion. All right, so here I have uh, initial setup of the project. There's not really a lot of code in here at the moment, but I I uh, I starting I'm starting with this. So we have our app object, and it has on it a property called randomizer, which is just a new uh, random number generator. Uh, pretty much any game you're going to want to make is going to need to randomly generate stuff for some reason or another. In our particular case, we're using this in one place. After a tank gets hit, we randomly move it to a different part of the screen. Uh, and then we have our main window. And this layout is pretty simple. There's just a giant canvas in the center. Well, not the center, but it's taking up most of the window. There's a button to start a new game and then two labels uh, for the scores for the tanks. I've put the events we want on the canvas, and we're only going to be dealing with the key down and the paint event handlers on this particular canvas. I have added a game timer. Uh, this thing runs often and will be responsible for updating all the graphics. The start button is just going to call our start game method, which at the moment is just initializing the scores and telling the canvas to do an initial refresh. And of course, we start the game right when the app starts so that you don't have to click the button. So as you can see, there's not nothing really here. This is just a shell of a game. But we can fill it in. And using these techniques, you can make a lot of different types of games. I started with combat mostly because, well, you know, I'm not really a great game maker kind of guy. Uh, so I figured I better start with something simple. And combat is probably the simplest game ever, other than Pong. But uh, Pong's kind of boring. So I said, I'll start with combat. And then I get these techniques down, could probably apply them to some other games that I might want to make. So this is why we're doing combat. Uh, so combat, the first things that you think about when um, you're playing combat is it's tanks. There's two tanks on the screen. So we need, we need some tanks. So what we're going to do here is add a tank. So I'm going to create a new class, and I'm going to give it the name tank because I am creative like that. So tank is just a class but it's going to have all the capabilities to know how to move around, how to draw itself, how to know if it gets hit, how to fire, all that stuff. So to start with, tank is going to need a few properties. So we'll just type them in here. We need to know its x coordinate on the canvas and its y coordinate. I am also going to need to know if I press the right shortcut key, there we go. The color of the tank. And I want to know the rotation of the tank. Now you may remember how a tank moves in combat is it can only go forward, but you can rotate it left or right. So the rotation is going to indicate how much the tank is actually rotated. And that's going to be stored in degrees. Uh, and you'll see in some of our drawing routines, we'll, we'll have to calculate that uh, to radians 
uh, to use some of the Zojo methods, but that's easily done. So here is our initial properties for uh, our tank class. And I'm going to give this a constructor to initialize it. And this will allow someone to create a new tank at a specific location. And I'll put in the parameters here. So this allows us to create a new tank, say where it starts on the main canvas, and uh, what color it initially is. So now we're cooking, uh, but no tank's going to appear anywhere because we haven't actually drawn a tank yet. So the next step is to actually uh, draw a tank. So I'm going to add another method here. I'm just going to call it draw. And for the parameter, I'm going to pass in the graphics object of the canvas where uh, the game's actually going to be displayed. So the tank will know how to draw itself on the canvas. Now, being a retro game, the graphics for this are very simple. And that is another reason why I like this, because I also can't draw. So why not draw using blocks? So we can make our tank using just fill rect and make it look kind of blocky, just like it did back in the Atari 2600 days. All right, so I can try typing this. I'm not a big fan of live typing, but what the heck. If I uh, start to make too many typos, I will just cut and paste. All right, this does point out one thing I forgot to set up, is our constants for the size of the tank. I want to add that to this class, and I'm just going to create a constant here, and our tank's going to be 40 points or pixels. I guess it's probably points these days. So we're creating a new picture for our tank. And then we can set its initial color to be the tank color. And then we can just draw some uh, rectangles to make our tank. Essentially, we want our tank to look like this. It's going to have, you know, tank treads, kind of a turret with a gun, and then more tank treads. So, you know, a pretty simple, blocky kind of looking tank. So we can do this just using a bunch of fill recs. And, you know, rather than typing these, because like I said, it'll make me nervous. I'm going to just paste these in. So you see, we're just essentially doing fill recs for each of the blocks that are up here using the coordinates to draw the little tank. You can, of course, draw whatever you want here. So if you have some, um, you know, you want to draw a circle or whatever, you can use the graphics commands to do that. Uh, you could also actually just draw an image here uh, directly onto the picture. So if you had a fancy graphic somewhere that you wanted to use for your tank instead, you could absolutely do that. And for performance purposes, it probably would make sense to actually, at the very least, uh, save what I'm drawing here off into a picture rather than redrawing it every time. But as you can see, for this simple game, it's plenty fast enough and shows how uh, you can do it. Now, one thing that's really nice about Zojo is it has the ability to rotate uh, graphics. Uh, as long as you convert them to uh, vector graphics first. So we can now take our picture and convert it to a vector graphic using the PixMatch shape class. And we can set its center coordinates so it rotates along the center of the tank. And we can then specify the rotation of this. Now, rotation is always in degrees. And as I mentioned, our rotation property, we're going to, I mean, sorry, rotation on the PixMax shape is in radians. But our rotation property that we have here is only storing degrees. So, uh, you know, 90 degrees would mean, you know, it's a quarter of the way around. So to convert degrees to radians, and I ended up Googling this, so I feel shame. But nonetheless, you just have to multiply it by a value that is actually pi over 180. 
so I just have this saved here so that we can do the rotation and then we can just draw our object onto the canvas that was passed to us and this will draw the tank uh, rotate it to the specified rotation and then draw it on the canvas so let's actually make sure it gets drawn on the canvas so if we go back to our window and I open up the canvas right down here in the paint event handler this is where uh, everything's going to get drawn so essentially here I can draw the tank but I don't need to have a tank um, what's going to what's going to give me a tank I well I need a tank and it probably makes sense that the start game method should be creating my tanks so I can create here I'm gonna I haven't created the property yet but I can have a property that I will shortly create that will be a tank and I can say new tank and let me just switch over here so I can get the right coordinates I want all right so this here would create two tanks the first one at these coordinates in blue and the second one at these other coordinates in red. And now I can add the tank property. I've pressed caps lock there. So I now have two tank properties that can store these tank instances that are created uh, when we uh, initialize the tank. So now I can actually draw the tanks. So I can go to the paint event handler and start to uh, put in some code for drawing the things. Well, first, I'm just going to put in a little error handling there. And then we can draw our tanks. So I'm going to set the color here for the background, and we'll just do a big uh, background fill and then we'll actually draw the two tanks that's it so that draws the tanks so theoretically if I run this I now have my canvas with my two tanks showing up on the screen. Now the tanks don't do anything yet. We can't move them or anything like that because we haven't implemented that. So uh, let's go ahead and do that next. So we'll go back to our tank, which I am also going to open in a new tab here. All right, so we have our everything visible here. So we have our draw method, which is drawing the tank. And now we need to be able to let the tank move around. Now, I mentioned earlier the tanks can only go forward uh, because they're tanks. And they can rotate left and right. So that kind of sounds like some good names for some methods here. So I'm going to have a method called forward. And this method is simply going to move the X and Y coordinates of the tank depending on the direction that it is facing. And I am definitely going to copy and paste this code here. So you can see right here, uh, we're essentially saying that each time uh, the tank moves, it's going to jump five pixels. Seemed like a reasonable distance. And then we check the rotation. And the tank, uh, we're allowing to rotate in 45 degree angles to keep the math simple, uh, which essentially means, you know, if this is at a uh, straight, you know, 180 degree angle, that's uh, pointing down. I uh, know that's pointing to the left. So if it's pointing to the left, 
All we have to do is decrease the x-coordinate to get it to move further to the left. But if it's pointing at, uh, say, 45 degrees, it's kind of at a slight angle, so we'd have to increase both the x and y coordinates to get it to move to the right of the canvas and down. So like I said, that keeps the math simple because 45 degrees uh, works really well on a grid. Uh, realistically, after I went back and played the actual combat game in an Atari 2600 simulator, it appeared to actually rotate a bit more frequently than 45 degrees, maybe like 30-ish degrees. That would probably require some trigonometry to come up with these values, and I'm not doing a class in that because I'd have to study harder. So we're sticking with these 45-degree turns. So anyway, this is moving the tank forward based on uh, what direction it is pointing. And you can see it's just we're just checking the degrees of the direction and then adjusting the x and y coordinates appropriately. Pretty simple math here. And the next two methods to add are the rotate left and rotate right methods. So the rotate right method I could probably type this, it's short enough, but I won't. Is essentially just rotating the tank by 45 degrees. As I, I noted, that's our rotation thing. And we just check to see if, uh, to keep the rotations from continuing up beyond 360, uh, if they get high, we start back down at zero. But other than that, we just uh, rotate, increase the rotation 45 degrees, and as you might guess, rotate left, does kind of the opposite. And here's rotate left. Same sort of thing, except it decreases the rotation by 45 degrees. Now the reason this works is because the draw method takes into account the x and y position and the rotation. So we just have to adjust those things in these methods. We don't have to actually do anything else. And the draw method will then redraw the tank at the appropriate location and direction. But we do need to actually provide a way to move the tank forward and change its direction. So here we go to the canvas key down event handler. And I'm just going to put the code to process the keys. So essentially for tank one, I'm gonna put in here that we use the arrow keys to move it around. All right, so that is essentially something like this. And we'll have a select case here. We check the key that was pressed and uh, I'm just checking the ASCII values for them. So ASCII value 30 is the up arrow. I should have a comment there. Up arrow. And then left arrow is 28. Right arrow is 29. And space is fire, but we're not up to fire yet. So I'm going to remove this one for the time being. So as you can see here, when you press the up arrow, we just call the forward method that we created, the rotate and the rotate. Now, if I run this, it's not actually going to do anything yet because our, our game doesn't have an, um, a way to update itself repeatedly. And that's kind of the purpose of the timer, our little game timer right here. And this is essentially to say, hey, you know, keep updating uh, things as, as they change. So, again... put in the little error handling line. And in this particular case, the only thing we need to start with is just to tell the canvas to update itself again in case uh, anything about the tank changed. And I put in my return values. I'm going to return true here so I don't get an annoying beep every time a key is pressed. So here's our tank. And I can press the left arrow, and it spins around the right arrow. And I can press the up arrow to move it. Hooray! I have a tank that can move around. Phase one is complete. All right, so the next thing we want to do 
is take a quick jump ahead to what the next steps are, which is adding the missile. So I'm going to close this particular project here. And I'm going to open up my jump ahead version that has player two tank all hooked up. So this one here has both tanks working. I can move around player two tank and the player one tank. Uh, the player two tank I've set up using the uh, WAD keys to move it. So other than that, it's pretty much the same. It just has the appropriate properties uh, in place for the tank and the extra code in the key down to move it. So the next thing we want to do is uh, add the missile. So, and I'm just uh, going to know, Cam asked me a question here regarding a name of a property that I'm just going to address before I get too far. He's wondering why I called this M rotation instead of just rotation. And the reason is because this is supposed to be marked as private. And generally speaking, uh, and it's a habit, uh, any properties that I put on classes that are private, I always have an M prefix in the front. Probably because I think Zojo, when you, uh, yes, when you create a computer property in Zojo and then you, uh, or when you create a property in Zojo and you right click on it to say convert to computed, it will uh, convert it using this particular uh, format. So I kind of got into the habit of doing that myself. All right, so to have a missile, we need the same sort of thing. We need a missile class. And it's going to follow pretty much the same structure as our tank class. Uh, it's going to have a couple constants here for the height and the width. The missile is not a square. Uh, let's see, what height do I have for the missile? Just all right, so the missile is only going to be five units high and 10 across. Missile is not very big. And we're going to have a constructor to create the missile. And our constructor is going to take a few parameters. And one is. I'll just paste them right in here. The parameters are the starting position of the missile and the direction it's going in, so that when you fire the missile, it actually is fired in the direction the tank is facing. And then here we can set the properties that are the uh, values that are passed in to our local properties, which I haven't yet created, but I will do now. So we have direction, we have x, and we have y. So our constructor, let me move this into its own tab. All right, so our constructor sets up uh, the missile, but we still need to draw it. And our draw code is even simpler than the tank draw code because the missile is essentially just a rectangle. So again, to create a new picture, uh, set its color, the missile is going to be white. Draw the rectangle and then do the same uh, conversion to a vector graphic so that it can easily be rotated. And then it gets drawn onto the canvas where it belongs. And the other important thing with a missile is you actually have to move it, but you also have to fire it. So let's see, uh, let's do the fire code first. Uh, it would be kind of funny to fire a missile that doesn't move. That, that might be a little uh, destructive to a tank when you fire a missile and it just kind of sits on your tank. All right, so I have here our tank. And to fire a missile, we essentially want to create a new missile. 
and then have it get drawn to the screen. So I'm going to add a method to the tank, and I'm going to call this method fire. And fire is going to return a missile. And we'll create the missile at the tank location and rotation, and then return it. So here we've just we've allowed the tank to create its own missile. So now we need a way for the tank to create a missile. We need a, a keyboard control for that. So we can go back to the window, and this is where we can add our fire command, which will just be the space bar. And all right, so I'm going to call the fire method. It's going to return a missile that I want to store in a property. Property that is a missile. So we now have the missile created. And we need to just draw it. So that's it, that draws the missile. That's pretty straightforward as well. And I think if I run this, we may actually see the missile appear. Assuming I have the code working properly. So I press the space bar here. You can see a missile appeared in the center of the tank. And hopefully it's not set on a timer or anything because it's bad news for Mr. Blue Tank. But what we want next is for our missile to actually head in the direction the tank is face facing. So we can go back to our missile class and add a move method. And this is going to look similar to the forward method of the tank because essentially the missile is just moving forward. And again, I'm going to move it five uh, pixels at a time and just check the direction and then adjust uh, the coordinates based on the direction. Uh, Still not going to move because we didn't call the move method. So I need to go back to the window. And we need to move the missile. Well, when do we move the missile? Remember, the game timer is running continuously. And essentially, we want to move a missile if there is a missile. So if it's, if it's not nil, then we will move it. All right, let's run that real quick. So now we've got a missile that's flying across the screen here and going right through the red tank because the missile at this point, I should say at this point, the tank doesn't know if it's been hit by a missile. It's not looking for that sort of thing. So this stuff just gets drawn on the screen and it's drawn. So it, it passes right through the tank until it's off the screen and uh, disappears. So the next thing to check is, uh, is the tank hit by the missile? So there's two ways to go about that. You could have the missile check if it hit a tank. I decided I prefer the idea of checking if the tank, or having the, the tank itself check if it has been hit by a missile. So we're going to do it that way. And as you might guess, that requires a couple more changes. So the first thing we're going to want to do on the missile is add a new computer property here. And this is just going to return, if I set its data type right, a rectangle for the missile.
So that's all that's going to do. That tells us essentially, hey, this is how much, this is the size of the missile. And then I'm going to add here a method. And it's going to be called is hit by. And this is going to take in a parameter of a, of a specific missile. And we're going to check if this tank is hit by this missile. I'm going to paste the code here. And, oops. All right, so we create a rectangle for the tank. We get the rectangle for the missile that is being passed in here. And then we just check if these two rectangles intersect. If they intersect with each other, well, then that means they're, they're touching in some manner. So the tank was hit by the missile. So then this is where we use our little random number generator. And uh, we're going to move this tank that just got hit to a different location on the screen. And we're going to return true to say, yeah, I was hit. Otherwise, return false, say, I'm clean, you missed me. All right, so like everything else, we have to go back to the window here. So let me just check that. And we need to have some more processing in our game timer. All right, so now we've checked that the missile exists, and we're now moving it. And we've now added our... Um, the method isn't showing up, so I want to make sure I set its data type. I did not. So we can check now. So is tank 2 hit by missile 1? Well, if it is, then we probably want to do something about that. So we want to get rid of the missile, so we'll just make it nil. And we can increase the score for tank one, because it hit the tank. So this is it. This is the code that will essentially check if uh, the tank was hit by the missile, and then get rid of the missile. So if I press this now, the missile will fly across screen and it hit the tank, and the tank moved ever so slightly. And I can move the tank again and continue to hit it repeatedly. You know, red tank is defenseless because we did not implement a way for it to fire a missile. So it's just a sitting duck. And I noticed uh, the score wasn't getting updated because we were not updating it. So what we can do is somewhere here, update the score. Uh, probably just put it here at the end of the pain event since that's called regularly. And then we can make sure we update the score with whatever changes happened to the score. So that's it for the tank's ability to move around, to fire a missile, and detect if it got hit. So again, to jump ahead, I'm going to open up the next project here that has all the code in so that tank 2 can fire its missile. And you can see, again, it's pretty much the same as the tank 1 code. Except that it can now fire missiles. So they can blow each other up to happy happiness. All right, so the next things to add are sound effects and joystick control. So sound effects. Sound effects are pretty easy. Uh, you just need some sound files, uh, which, of course, I just happen to have. And the cool thing about making retro games is 
it's really easy to find recordings of the sounds used by retro games. So I here scoured the internet for weeks to find the two best sounds for shooting a missile and getting hit. And they are here, fire sound and hit sound. Now, theoretically, when I started this uh, screen sharing, I set it up to capture the system audio, so hopefully you'll actually hear these sounds when we go to test them. So the fire sound is called when you fire. So it probably makes sense that I want to go to my fire method, and I want to say, play the fire sound. Similarly, do the same thing when I get hit. So that's it for adding our sound effects. I have no idea if you guys were able to hear that sound, but it was a little kind of crunchy, 8-bit soundy white noise kind of things. Justin says he heard it. That's great. I'm glad that worked. So adding sound effects, really easy. Uh, the hard, I wouldn't say it's hard, but the part that you ends up uh, getting sucked down a rabbit hole is actually looking for these sounds you want to use and testing out a million different ones and making sure you have appropriate licenses to use them and all that fun stuff. Uh, but joysticks. All right. Uh, let's see here. I got another project I want to open before we look at that. This is um, a little project that will... Show you the buttons on a gamepad or any input device you have plugged in to your computer. So you can see right now I've got a lot of stuff plugged into my computer, but in particular this is the Macaulay iShock 2 game controller that I have. It's plugged into a USB port at the moment. And you can see this thing has a ton of buttons, way more than the Atari 2600 had, which was one. Uh, plus the joystick itself. So in the case of this, uh, the fire button, uh, you see if I press it here, you can see one of the values is turning to a 1 right here. So that's button number 5. So that's what I want to use as the fire button. And the little game pad that lets me move the direction, see I push up. I can see pushing up is actually button 1. Pushing down is button 2. Pushing left is button 3. And pushing right is button 4. So I can make a note of this stuff on my little scratch pad. If I wanted to use other buttons on here, I certainly could. There's uh, analog joysticks that you can see as I spin them around, get different uh, values here. There's shoulder buttons that change. All kinds of buttons on these things. And this example project allows you to figure out what's what so that you can actually use it in your Zojo project. All right, so to access these game pads in Zojo, you need a couple classes. All right, so the first thing we want to do is add where we, uh, I have my window selected. Okay, I lost my uh, place for a moment there. So I want to add a property to the window, not to this project. So let me close this one. That's why I was confused. I had the wrong project in the front. All right. So we're going to add a property to the window. And this is going to be a game input manager. And I'm going to add another property, device, which is going to be a game input device. The game input manager class uh, is responsible for uh, essentially polling for USB devices and getting a list of them. And then what we're going to do is look for uh, my specific gamepad and then assign that to the device property so they can be used with the game. So to do that, I have a method here, which I'm just going to paste in. And here's the method here. It's called check controller. And it's basically broken down into two sections. Uh, the first section here at the top is just looking for my gamepad. So it's looping through all the devices on the input manager and checking the name to find the, the Macaulay gamepad that I have. If you had a different uh, controller, you would want to put the name here so it's selected 
and that's what the other uh, example project's great for because it shows you all the names so you can you know note all this stuff and then just plug in the values here. So assuming it finds it, it assigns it to device and that can be used in the code below. If it can't find the Macaulay, that means I unplugged the joystick for some reason. So uh, it can't be used and it'll just return. And after this, we essentially can just go through this device, which we now know is the gamepad, and just loop through all its buttons and check to see which ones uh, has been pressed. So we're looping through all the buttons. Uh, we're getting a specific button. We're checking its name. And then we uh, look for the values that we found by pressing them to get the ones we wanted and noted that, all right, button one means move forward. If its value is one, which means it's actually been pressed, being pressed, we call the same move forward uh, method that we called when the up arrow was pressed. So that code itself doesn't change. You're just processing what buttons were pressed on your gamepad. And that's all this method does. It just uh, essentially moves the tank when the appropriate uh, buttons are pressed. Uh, I did find, however, that it works better if it has its own timer that's checking the controller. So I'm going to add a new timer here. And actually, what do I want to say? I think probably set this. It doesn't need to check the controller nearly as often as the actual screen updates. And we can just tell this particular timer to check the controller. It will run in addition to the other timers. So both these timers are going to be running uh, periodically. Uh, one doesn't supersede the other or anything like that. And that should pretty much be it if I'm looking over here. So let me just run this. Oh, now we get an error. Yes, we do, because I did not initialize our input manager. All right, so we want to do that on the window, and then we have an open event here that is starting the game. But before I start the game, I actually want to create an instance of the input manager so that we can use it. So here I have my tanks. I'm now holding gamepad in my hand. And I'm pushing the up button on it and rotating it around, the fire button. So the joystick works just like the keyboard controls. So that is it. That is combat in all its glory. Uh, if you remember the Atari 2600 one, they had lots of different variations of combat. There were uh, barriers that could appear in the middle of the screen. Uh, there was features that would allow your missiles when they reach the end of the screen to wrap around to the other side, uh, just like they would in the real world. Um, and I think there was even some levels where the missiles would bounce when they hit the sides. And there were even other levels in combat that used airplanes and stuff to fly around. So lots more uh, things that can be done there uh, to test that out. And speaking of which, what, time, what do we have for time here? Oh. Good timing. All right, if anyone's got any questions on this or anything else, uh, feel free to ask now while I bring up this other thing. All right, the other project that I want to quickly show you is one I am in the process of working on, my Space Rocks project. I'm not going to really show the code for this one just yet, but this is attempting to be Space Invaders. I don't really have rocks, though. I've got bubbles. But I can turn my little ship. I can blow up the bubbles, and they get into smaller bubbles. Which is cool. I can move the ship around. But I have no collision detection on the ship, so he's invincible, like in force fields. So I still have more work to do. But this is using the same techniques that I just showed to use for combat. So... Uh, I suspect I'll probably be able to whip up a Space Invaders as well when I get around to it. <laughs> yep, 
yes, I did mean asteroids, but you know, it's space rocks. Although I did call my one of my classes here asteroid. All right, yeah, the set, Justin Elliott was noting the asteroid sounds were actual uh, recordings from an arcade game. I managed to find someone that had those somewhere to grab, so they're they're not the actual 2600 sounds. They're from the original arcade game Asteroids, which is kind of cool. And let's close these, and I can open up the final combat project. This is the final combat project. Has a perhaps a few extra things here. It's checking uh, for things if they reach the edge of the canvas. Uh, so that they, uh, yeah, particularly for the missiles, so that they stop being drawn if they can't be displayed. And there's probably a little more error checking and stuff in this particular final version, but it works the same. So now that everyone's seen how pretty easy once you get the framework set up for how you can make these uh, old school retro games using Zojo, I expect to see all kinds of Atari 2600 games appearing because I want to play them. And if you're looking for ideas, you can find the Stella multi-platform Atari 2600 emulator here on Source Purge, which is what I use. Uh, this thing's fun to test out all those old games, assuming you can find uh, ROM files for them. and uh, you can uh, test them out, get a feel for how they work, and then easily replicate some of them in Zojo. Let's see. Oh, Adrian is also noting another website that I will type in here, retrogames.co.uk. Lots of retro game stuff here. Very cool. I have not seen this website before. I will leave that up so I can check it out. And before I wrap up here, I want to remind everyone about the 2015 Zojo Developer Conference. If you're interested in attending, I have two important uh, dates for you to remember. Uh, the end of October is the deadline for the call to speakers. So if you would like to present at XDC in April, uh, make sure you submit your presentation before the end of October. And otherwise, uh, early registration goes through November. And that saves you $250 off the, uh, I think it's about $1,000 registration. So if you are serious about coming, registering early can save you a good chunk of change. And of course, ensures you have a spot because XTC did sell out last year. And there's a pretty good chance it'll sell out this year uh, because we're going to be having a lot of iOS related stuff to be showing people. So definitely uh, check out our cool website that shows off some XTC stuff. and. Uh, Register if that's something you want to do. It's in Austin, Texas next year, uh, right on this uh, water. I didn't know Austin, Austin had water, so go figure. That should be fun. I also want to remind everyone about the Zojo Forum, forum.zojo.com. A great place to ask questions, help other people, and just in general learn about Zojo. Lots of topics here, very active forum. We've, uh, we really like it. So definitely head over there, ask questions is it for the apps you're creating or help out other people that are on there, whatever works for you. And of course, all recordings of these webinars are on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash gozojo. I think up here it shows slash user slash gozojo, but just slash gozojo works. And uh, I don't know the exact count of webinars we have up here, but it's got to be close to 60. So you can certainly watch those at your leisure. And it's great for people that uh, find that I talk very quickly when I'm doing these, but we do have a, a limited time. Uh, but you can wa re watch the recording, pause it, look at the code, and even better, I'll have the source code available for you to download so you can look at it. And the source code is available, or will be available today but it will be available here at this page here, which has the lists again of all the webinars, including relevant examples or slides or whatnot.
and there'll be an entry showing up here today for the retro gaming webinar with uh, links to the slides and all the examples we looked at. So it looks like we've reached the end of this week's webinar. I want to thank everyone for attending. Have a great rest of your day.